Dr. Hammerhoff, why don't you take it away? Well, thank you, Allison. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm going to talk about anesthesia and consciousness. And what you see in the slide is a, uh, we'll get back to is ether frolics and low concentrations anesthetics, gas anesthetics uh, have a euphoric giddy effect. And then you breathe more and you go to sleep. This is a biphasic effect seen in a lot of types of drugs. Succinylcholine, for example, causes every muscle to twitch and then relax. So it's a common feature of, uh, of, of many drugs, but anesthetics, the, the dependent variable. So anesthesia and consciousness. So um, in the year 2000, uh, the millennium there, this book appeared uh, about the greatest inventions of the past 2000 years. And as you can see, anesthesia is at the top of the list, alphabetically at least. And I wrote this chapter and what I said was, imagine we lived in a world without anesthesia and we face you know, breaking an arm or having an appendix burst or everything else, we live in fear. So having anesthesia really makes a difference. In ancient times before anesthesia in Assyria, Egypt, Greece, China, India, they used uh, drugs like cannabis, mandragora, which is a nightshade, opium, belladonna, alcohol, and dozens of medicinal plants, plant alkaloids. The Assyrians, Egyptians, and Greeks induced artificial sleep by pressing both carotid arteries. This is frowned on today. And Peruvian shamans actually did local anesthesia with coca leaves. They would chew the coca leaves and then spit into the wound for trephination. So this was maybe the first local anesthetic. So here you can see some of their work. Uh, they actually did a pretty nice job uh, drilling holes into the skull to lay, uh, let out evil humors. How that worked out uh, clinically, we're not sure. But uh, here is a uh, picture of a trephination with a shaman having just spat into the wound. And uh, I assume they had a timeout and they're now proceeding uh, with the case. We don't know how it turned out. In 1540, sweet oil of vitriol uh, containing diethyl ether was synthesized and used as a supplement in chicken feed as its sweet taste made the chickens eat more and fatten up. But the chickens tended to then fall asleep. In the 19th century, uh, gases diethyl ether, nitrous oxide, laughing gas, and chloroform were found to be euphoric when inhaled at low concentrations and were used socially. And here are the ether frolics that I mentioned uh, before showing the uh, biphasic effect, low concentrations, they cause giddiness and euphoria, and then you keep breathing and you fall asleep. And here, uh, nitrous oxide uh, was also used, laughing gas. And you can see at the top, it says living made easy. And at the bottom, probably a, a sexist remark, uh, prescription for stolen wives. And then we move along to the ether dome and uh, uh, the uh, Morton's uh, uh, demonstration of uh, diethyl ether. And then you can see some of his uh, colleagues. Uh, there's Dr. Lichtenthal, there's me. Uh, there's uh, Dr. Leslie and a few others of us who are just kidding. Um, here's another sort of famous case that happened at uh, our hospital in the mid eighties. Uh, Jack Copeland, the heart surgeon in the middle uh, uh, had been uh, doing heart transplants and he did the first uh, bridge to transplant. And uh, this uh, uh, Jarvik seven was put into a patient who was dying of uh, cardiomyopathy. There was no heart available. And uh, the guy lived on it about a month and then a heart came in one night and uh, he put it in. This, this was, I think the first, pardon me, bridge, bridge to transplant. And uh, um, you can see uh, in the background, Dave Wiggum, one of our uh, really great residents and uh, myself and Randy Cork, who's now in New Zealand. Dave is in Wenatchee, Washington. Um, so let's talk about anesthesia. What is anesthesia? Uh, immobility, no movement in response to surgical painful stimulus. Amnesia, no memory of events during anesthesia. Loss of consciousness, no awareness during anesthesia. However, um, about uh, 25 years ago, the loss of consciousness began to be omitted from the definition of anesthesia um, by, uh, in a paper, for example, by Ted Eager and his colleagues uh, UCSF in the West Coast, and then uh, Campagna et al., including Keith Miller uh, from uh, Harvard, 
on the East Coast and uh, kind of the West Coast Mafia and the East Coast Mafia decided to get rid of loss of consciousness from the definition of anesthesia because they said that consciousness cannot be measured, observed, or explained, and or could be illusory. And uh, there are many philosophers and neuroscientists who claim that consciousness is an illusion, an illusion of whom to whom is unclear. But um, uh, and I'll, I'll come to why uh, people people think that because it's it's difficult to explain. Um, this uh, this omission of con a loss of consciousness from anesthesia was followed by what I would call an era of great awakening. Here's an article from the Associated Press, 2008. 30,000 people a year awake during surgery. And this uh, commented on an article about uh, comparing the BIS monitor uh, to uh, just following clinical signs, which is what we do when we don't have a, a BIS or a sed line. And uh, there were actually more cases of awareness in the, in the BIS study. This was a couple thousand patients in each group from uh, WashU, St. Louis, I think. And uh, they commented that 60 million per year were spent on BIS electrodes. And uh, I'll just leave it at that. They didn't, they didn't prove to be any better. And there's a couple of problems. Number one, uh, the BIS and the set line tell you what happened a little while in the past. And we want to know what's happening immediately. And uh, uh, they don't really uh, uh, tell us what that number means. So it's a little bit annoying for that. But uh, I, I don't use them. And I find when I do use them, I wind up staring at the number and ignoring the patient, which is the opposite of what we should be doing. Then there are presently still consciousness deniers, I would call them. Uh, for example, Emory Brown and his group from, uh, from Harvard or MIT. And uh, in this paper, um, they discuss five classes of receptors affecting uh, arousal and sedation. And they talk about uh, GABA receptors and drugs like propofol, opi opioid receptors, drugs like fentanyl, et cetera, uh, NMDA, uh, ketamine, uh, alpha adrenergic, dexmedetomidine, and dopamine neuroleptic, uh, and uh, they do not discuss consciousness nor gas anesthetics, but conclude our analysis shows that general anesthesia is less mysteriously less mysterious than currently believed. So, if you ignore consciousness, yes, uh, anesthesia is uh, fairly easy to explain, but uh, that's kind of missing the point, I would say. So let's talk about Mac. Uh, Eager um, uh, did a really great thing with Larry Sademan and others coming out with this idea of Mac, which is essentially an ED50 for anesthesia. Um, now, all other drugs that we use, most other drugs uh, are intravenous, polar, soluble, and anesthetics are completely different. And uh, most people come into this uh, from pharmacology to study how anesthetics work. So. This was actually a great, a great step forward to define an ED50 in terms of gas phase. So it's the equilibrated concentration of inhaled gas at which 50% of animals or humans move or don't move in response to a surgical stimulation. Uh, so it's inversely related to potency. So in the animal studies, it was usually clamping a tail, something like that. Uh, and this was uh, the seminal paper in 1965. So immobility, uh, uh, Mac addresses immobility. There are other uh, varieties of MAC. At the top, we see uh, MAC for movement, one, one MAC. Then uh, MAC awake uh, conscious, uh, for consciousness, 0.2 to 0.5. Memory, about the same, 0.2 to 0.5. And then to prevent autonomic response, 1.5 to 2.0. Uh, so th this refers to suppressing hemodynamic responses to surgical stimulation. So they're prepping for five minutes, the patient's equilibrated, they take the knife and the patient moves. Um, so if you're at 1.5 to 2.0 uh, uh, MAC, you'll suppress that. Of course, at that range, we may also get into causing our own suppression from the anesthetic, but this refers to, MAC bar refers to uh, uh, preventing uh, responses to surgical stimulation. So if we put them, these all on, on one line, we can see that um, in the middle is MAC, uh, they're all bell-shaped curves, movement with stimulation. Uh, to the right is a MAC bar preventing or blunting autonomic responses. And on the left is MAC awake and also MAC remember, uh, which is based mostly on response to command and amnesia. And to some extent, loss of global coherent EEG and consciousness. Probably the best study EEG goes way back to uh, E. Roy John at NYU. Uh, 
who studied uh, many patients uh, uh, going to sleep and emerging and, and came up with that. It's been repeated in many ways since. Um, so MAC uh, for immo MAC, immobility, uh, where is it mediated? Uh, in the early 90s, Antonini at UC Davis measured MAC in goats. And then he sequentially severed the cortex, measured MAC, severed thalamus, um, measured MAC, and the brainstem. MAC did not change. And he concluded that uh, spinal cord reflexes mediate MAC. Now, this is a little bit uh, deflating to us because we think we're treating the brain, and we are. But the, the movement per se, which happens at one MAC, is one thing. Uh, this doesn't speak to the uh, uh, MAC consciousness, which, which happens to point 0.2 to point 0.5, as I said. The other conclusion from this is that movement or autonomic response above 0 0.5 MAC, above a half a MAC, is very likely to be non-conscious. So that's why, you know, in the patient's hypotensive, we, we make sure they have a half a MAC and they should be okay. Uh, also, non-conscious movement or autonomic response is arousal. It doesn't mean they're awake if they move. So if we put arousal there uh, in the middle, uh, that's more accurate. So loss of consciousness, I'm gonna skip over memory because it's, it's, uh, it's di more difficult to measure and I'm, I have my own thoughts about that. But, um, it's difficult to determine, and, uh, often described to response to command, for example, open your eyes, squeeze my hand, take a deep breath, scratch your eyes, don't scratch your eyes. So if they respond to command appropriately, uh, we assume they're conscious and awake. And uh, based on this, Mac awake is thought to be 0.2 to 0.5. So here we have it where we've kind of zoomed in on the Mac awake uh, 0.2 or actually less than 0.5. And uh, the thought is that response to command upon emergence is asserted to imply conscious awareness. Maybe, because it's also possible that you can be uh, in, the, in this range uh, or even higher and uh, uh, respond appropriately, but be non-conscious. Uh, what, what's called in philosophy, zombie behavior. A zombie is someone who looks and acts like us, but actually has no inner light, no inner consciousness. So, and when a patient first wakes up and they kind of stare at you, I often wonder, are they really conscious or, or, uh, or what? So they could be responding in zombie mode. Similarly, they, they may be conscious, but don't respond. They could be playing possum. And uh, you know, maybe they're, they're, uh, you're saying, uh, take a deep breath and they say, they're thinking, go away, I'm enjoying my opiate and uh, I, feel, I feel good for the first time in a long time, something like that. So we don't really know, but roughly, 0.2 to 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.5 is, is a good number to remember, even though it may be plus or minus. So how does consciousness occur in the brain? What can we learn from anesthesia about how, how consciousness occurs in the brain? So in Western philosophy, the world out there is all in our heads. Here, this is Plato, by the way, supposedly. Bing, and I'll use Bing to imply conscious awareness because remember the brain is quite active even when it's unconscious. Uh, if you do a, a spine case and do monitoring or a neuro case and uh, you're monitoring uh, evoked potentials to the brain, the patient's unconscious. So uh, consciousness is something different, which is what we're trying to figure out. So Bing is meant to apply having conscious experience. In Eastern philosophy, consciousness pervades a deeper level of reality. Bing is everywhere. Eastern philosophy would say we're, we're swimming or, or we're a wave in a, in a sea of, of consciousness. Maybe that's right. Uh, going back to Western philosophy, uh, Plato uh, realized that uh, because uh, the world out there is all in our head, we don't really know what's out there accurately. Conscious perception may only poorly portray reality. And he came up with this allegory of Plato's cave where these prisoners were uh, able to only see straight uh, shadows on the cave wall with a fire behind them. And to them, that was their reality or two dimensions were their reality. And this uh, implies to some people that there are deeper levels, deeper dimensions to our own present reality, which may be true. And along these lines that we can't really trust uh, what's out there based on our consciousness, uh, Descartes uh, said, I think therefore I am, that's the only thing he knows. And he said that we could each be a mere brain in a vat fed information by an evil genius. 
And here's a brain in a vat thinking that he or she is walking outside in the sun. So let's go back to uh, Western philosophy and the brain. And uh, so here's a, here's a brain and we see the thalamus and sensory inputs, except for smell, uh, uh, route through the thalamus. So here's the, the thalamus in the middle. So whether it's from the eyes, uh, from the spinal cord, from the ears, from uh, wherever, um, it goes to thalamus, except for smell, which goes directly into olfactory cortex over here. Um, and from thalamus, uh, the signals go to the appropriate uh, sensory cortex. In the case of vision, this is in the back of the brain, V1. So uh, the green arrow one it is the thalamocortical projection for vision to the back of the brain. From primary cortex in the back of the brain, there's a, a second wave through associative cortex that goes to the front of the brain. And this could go through uh, taste, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, motion, color, meaning, shape are picked up in visual cortex. Then you get to the others and there's integration and association until you get to the prefrontal cortex and, uh, and areas around that. And then there's a third wave projecting to other areas of cortex throughout the brain. And uh, it looks like this, it's this third wave that's mostly associated with consciousness. But some people think thalamocortical projections are conscious, for example, to the back of the brain or to any part of the brain, uh, depending on the sensory cortex. So for example, uh, thalamocortical first wave or first order theories of anesthesia and consciousness include Mike Alkire, who's an anesthesiologist uh, at, or at least he was at Irvine, and Ned Block, who's a well-known philosopher at NYU. They don't work together. They have uh, sim uh, similar views coming from anesthesia and uh, philosophy. They, they suggest that consciousness depends on these large-scale thalamocortical interactions. And that, at least Alkar says, that anest anesthetics act by blocking thalamocortical projections. So here's some data from one of Alkar's uh, papers. And it's actually kind of a meta-analysis of a number of different studies. Uh, so the colors are different, but the colors all indicate decreased blood flow. And this is fMRI studies. And what fMRI and blood flow and bold signal have to do with consciousness is another story. I'll come back to that. But at first glance, this looks uh, pretty, pretty convincing because the thalamus and the cortex are all diminished in terms of cerebral act, uh, uh, blood flow and activity with clonidine, propofol, more propofol, sevoflurane, halothane, isoflurane, lorazepam, et cetera, dex, even dexmedetomidine, dexmedetomidine, reduce the blood flow and the activity in thalamocortex. So uh, this is an argument on, on their behalf that uh, uh, consciousness depends on thalamocortical projection and anesthesia takes that away. Does, uh, so if that were the case, then thalamocortical stimulation uh, might be expected to reverse anesthesia and cause consciousness. And this paper came out uh, last year from University of Wisconsin, which uh, has a great anesthesia department. Uh, we had Kelly McQueen here uh, a few a month or so ago, and it has a long story tradition. And uh, what they did, this is from Yuri Salman's lab. And, uh, what they did was they had monkeys who were anesthetized with isoflurane at three different uh, concentration rates. Low. Could somebody mute, please? Thank you. At low, medium, and high concentration. The um, Mac well, of Isoflurane. Well, is, can you mute your your stuff? Sorry, Stu, to interrupt. Okay, thank you. Thank you. In high concentrations, the Mac of Isoflurane is one point one seven, so it's a near the top of the what they call the medium range. They then uh, put electrodes, or they had they implanted electrodes into the central lateral thalamus after hours of anesthesia with no stimulation. Electricity was applied to the central lateral. Uh, uh, thalamus, at the low and medium doses, the monkeys responded with arousal and movement. Above 1.2%, no such reaction. They didn't respond. So basically, arousal movement was suppressed at about one MAC, pretty much what would be expected. Arousal doesn't necessarily imply consciousness. Nonetheless, they kind of claimed or hinted in the title and throughout the paper that they were reversing anesthesia to cause consciousness. But they don't really know that they cause consciousness. They, 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 they ablated arousal at one MAC, which is what happened. 
which is what you would expect. So I think this is kind of a bait and switch uh, paper. And we see a lot of these uh, talking about consciousness. When it gets down to it, it's some correlate of consciousness that, that may or may not reflect consciousness. So beware bait and swapping. Uh, not to uh, beat a dead horse uh, even further, but um, Ben Libet in 1970s um, had uh, uh, ver some very interesting studies, one of which he uh, stimulated the thalamus in humans and uh, um, looked at their uh, cortical potentials and when they felt, felt it. So, so he had patients who were uh, undergoing neurosurgery and uh, with their brain under local, with their brains exposed, and uh, he worked with a, a neurosurgeon, Bertram Feinstein, and he did uh, various studies. And he would ask the patients when they felt it. And in this case, they did not feel it. Thalamic stimulation resulted in an evoked potential, which is normally associated with conscious perception and activity, but then it stopped. When he, when he stimulated uh, the hand itself, so this was a thalamic stimulation of the hand area. If he stimulated the hand itself, he got the evoked potential, the patients said they feel it right away, but what he determined was that what was necessary was 500 milliseconds of ongoing activity after the evoked potential to get to what he called neuronal adequacy. And without this 500, milli uh, 500 milliseconds of activity, so it's absent here, there's no neuronal adequacy and there's no conscious experience. And he concluded that the brain somehow sent information backward in time. And when this came out, uh, he was greeted with derision and booze from uh, neuroscientists and say, that's impossible. Well, in physics, it's actually not impossible, but, but he was berated and, and uh, but uh, he sort of stuck to his guns. And more recently, uh, the physics has, has shown that this is indeed possible. And um, um, I'll come back to that, that point if I ha um, have time. But the point is that thalamic stimulation per se doesn't cause conscious awareness. Uh, to further beat this dead horse, um, psychedelics expand consciousness. Uh, do they increase thalamocortical uh, activity and fMRI signals? So uh, psychedelics uh, cause expanded uh, hallucinations, uh, deep, uh, deeper sense of reality, et cetera, et cetera. So you'd expect the fMRI to kind of light up like a pinball machine. So in this study, uh, at least most people would, and I did until I saw this study, um, in 2012, Carhart Harris, who was at uh, Imperial College in London, and is just now moving to UCSF to start up their new psychedelic research program. Uh, he's been to our consciousness conference many times. I had this uh, paper in PNAS, neural correlates of the psychedelic state as determined by fMRI studies with psilocybin. And uh, the blue indicates decreased cerebral blood flow after psilocybin versus after placebo. So it's a subtraction. A uh, film. So this tells you where there's reduced activity under the influence of psilocybin. These people were in an MRI scanner with an IV getting intravenous psilocybin, and they reported later what what they were feeling and thinking. Uh, they didn't they didn't attempt to report during the uh, during the experience because of artifact or talking and so forth. But uh, they reported later that they were having a profound uh, psychedelic experiences, and you can look it up in this paper but their uh, fMRI looked cold and dark. Um, and they repeated this with EEG and found the same thing that EEG was suppressed and, and almost flatlined. So this was a kind of a confounding finding. <coughs> Excuse me. The inclusion being that psilocybin expands consciousness but decreases thalamocortical fMRI signals and cerebral blood flow. So I interpret this that uh, membrane dependent cognition requires en energy and that consciousness might depend on uh, activity going on inside neurons that are low energy, that are quantum processes, which are very low energy. So this fits with an approach that, that consciousness uh, comes from inside neurons at the quantum level, which uh, we'll come to uh, later. So, but it raises the question, what type of neural activity correlates with consciousness? So if we go back to our, our third uh, three waves um, through the brain, um, conscious perception involves three waves. And the first and second wave, as I mentioned, continued during anesthesia. This is how we uh, monitor evoked potentials in brain monitoring. So one and two are still there. One and two, first and second waves are not conscious. 
only the third wave feedback feedback because it's going going backward uh it's going in all directions but it's feedback in this sense is inhibited by anesthesia and by all three types basically of anesthesia propofol volatile inhalational uh, gas anesthetics and ketamine selectively preventing consciousness this, this study was done by george mature's group uh, university of michigan 2013 and uh, uh, George is, uh, is the department head now and uh, uh, is a big uh, fishing out of consciousness, does some amazing consciousness research. And is, I've known him a long time. He comes to our conferences and is actually co-sponsor of our conferences. Uh, they've got a big center for consciousness science at University of Michigan that's very well funded. So he showed that only the third wave is inhibited by anesthesia by not just gas, but propofol and ketamine. So the third, the, the third wave correlates with consciousness uh, and occurs uh, several hundred milliseconds after sensory input. So you remember uh, from the Libet study that it took uh, hundreds of milliseconds uh, for neuronal adequacy, even if you perceive consciousness earlier at 100 milliseconds. So there's the bing at, at uh, several hundred milliseconds after a sensory impingement. So here's the conundrum. Activity correlating with conscious perception uh, occurs at 300 milliseconds, but we often respond seemingly consciously within 100 milliseconds. Consciousness is thus deemed an illusion. This is why mainstream neuroscientists and philosophers say that consciousness is an epiphenomenal illusion and we have a false sense that we're in control. So if we're interacting with somebody rapidly back and forth and uh, Allison says something and I respond right back, if you measure my brain for for the activity that correlates with what she said, it's happen it occurs after I've already responded. So the uh, mainstream would say I'm responding with my inner zombie or my non-conscious autopilot, whatever you want to call it, and have this false illusion that I'm in conscious control. So that's that's the situation. Um, consciousness is deemed an illusion. But if we go back to Libet and the backward time effect. It could be that this backward time effect is actually allowing us to be conscious in real time. And it's not illusion, but it requires this, this trick of backward time effect. And uh, I actually wrote, wrote a, a paper about this called, uh, oh, there it is, how quantum brain biology can rescue conscious free will. If you just Google that, you'll, you'll find it. It's in Frontiers. And it's actually my most popular paper, 55,000 hits or something like that. And uh, I'm now working with Roger Penrose on an update of that because he has a, a new, new take on the physics that allows backward time effects. And this has been reported in, in many contexts in, in the parapsychology literature and even in mainstream neuroscience, science, but they tend to, uh, they tend to hide it. They, they can't explain it, so they kind of ignore it. Okay, um, this three wave uh, idea is also consistent with the major theories of consciousness and uh, uh, there, the uh, Templeton World Charity Foundation in their program, Accelerating Research and Consciousness, identified five major theories. Uh, I'm not gonna go into this too much. Global neuronal workspace, higher order thought, uh, predictive coding, uh, recurrent processing, integrated information theory, and ORCOR. ORCOR is the theory I have with Roger Penrose. Uh, and it kind of applies to, the others are all kind of um, wiring diagrams. Global neuronal workspace and higher order thought both say that the frontal cortex projects broadcast throughout the brain. So that's kind of wave three. PC, uh, uh, predictive coding recurrent process could be in the three uh, back, feeding back against two. So it's this kind of rubbing against each other or uh, uh, <coughs> predictive coding. You have a prediction and then you update it. Uh, so that would be PCRT. IIT predicts uh, a projection from the front to the posterior hot zones. And our theory could be compatible with any or all of them. Uh, they could all be right or wrong. It doesn't matter. Consciousness still would depend on what's going on at a deeper level. And where that might occur, I'll, I'll come to in a minute. So why is third wave feedback associated with consciousness and inhibited by anesthesia? Well, if we get to the, uh, the cortex, the cortex has six layers, one, two, three, four, five, six. The third wave uh, comes into layer four. Four projects to one, two, three, and six. One, two, three, and six then converge on layer five pyramidal cells. These layer five pyramidal cells have these giant uh, cone-shaped bodies. Their apical dendrites go to the surface and are parallel and uh, perpendicular to the surface, parallel to each other. And this is where EEG comes <laughs> yeah. from. Uh, 
uh, and the, their motor outputs go to the spinal pyramidal tracts to control behavior. They also have these uh, basilar dendrites that connect to each other, uh, dendritic-dendritic connections, and this, this dendritic web goes throughout the entire cortex, and Carl Prebrum uh, ascribed consciousness to this dendritic web in, uh, in pyramidal cells, and I think that may be right. He thought it was causing interference in, in a hologram that was projected to the brain. But anyway, dendritic dendritic interactions in layer five may be the origin of consciousness, bing, bing, bing. So if we look inside a pyramidal cell, uh, here's the apical dendrite that goes to the surface. Here's the axon where the, and we see the microtubules inside. The microtubules and the axons are different. They're uninterrupted, whereas every dendrite and soma, they're interrupted. And uh, um, these are the uh, pyramidal uh, uh, outflow tracts to control behavior. I think these are the most likely sites for consciousness in the brain. Um, so, uh, but they're characterized as Hodgkin-Huxley integrate and fire neurons, as are all neurons. So Hodgkin-Huxley in the 50s uh, developed this idea based on ion uh, fluxes, where uh, there's integration in the cell body and dendrites, which uh, reaches a threshold for firing. So integrate, fire, integrate, fire, integrate, fire, based on a threshold. So uh, this, this characterizes neurons as uh, threshold logic devices, which you can make a computer of. And so this lends itself to computer analogies. And here we see a bunch of neurons and here we see a computer uh, no network. And these are thought to be essentially the same. Um, but this, this makes the system algorithmic, deterministic, machine-like, and, uh, and too late really for consciousness, as I said before. Uh, and there's no room for consciousness, creativity, intuition, insight, or free will. Uh, this is what the Hodgkin-Huxley uh, uh, would predict. Integration here, firing here, or uh, schematically it's here. So it's integrate. It doesn't necessarily be have to be linear, but you reach this very narrow uh, threshold and there's firing here within a very narrow time window. And the firing is thought to occur um, by sequential openings of ion channels in the axon which is why it's slanted. However, if you look at an actual pyramidal cell, uh, the pyramidal cells that I've been talking about in awake animals and awake cats, and this was done in this paper by Nondorf et al., you get a different picture. You get uh, a very wide uh, threshold and a very wide temporal variability. Uh, and the spikes uh, are vertical. So we have a, a wide threshold, wide temporal variability and vertical spikes. The vertical spikes suggest that the ion channels open simultaneously rather than sequen sequentially. But the point is that some non-computable effect, something other than the threshold and the integration, integrated fire is regulating fires, uh, is regulating the axonal firing and spikes which control our behavior, control our actions. This is a extremely convenient place, locus for consciousness to supervene and control our actions by modulating the, the firing of Hodgkin-Huxley neurons. So there's the bing. Where, this is where consciousness could regulate behavior. And without consciousness, we can still go, go about our autonomic uh, non-conscious activities. This would be coming from a deeper level. And uh, for example, it, uh, uh, it could be coming from inside the neuron. So here we see a neuron. And uh, the, uh, the question is, uh, this, the, the uh, the variability come from inside or does consciousness come from inside or does it come from, as most people say, from membrane-based synaptic activities here at the synapse? Or does it come from inside the, uh, inside the, the dendrites and the, and the soma uh, in the microtubules and the cytoskeleton? So I just mentioned the theory I have with uh, Roger Penrose, there's an activity goes on in all the microtubules, you reach a threshold, this threshold, which is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, there's a quantum state reduction that causes collapse. I'm not going to go into that, but the point is that there's at least one theory, and actually there's others um, that, that derive from uh, microtubules and processes inside neurons causing consciousness that could, uh, that could modulate uh, the firing threshold and, and, uh, and it'll break us away from uh, being uh, zombies and having no free will and no conscious uh, creativity. So how do we decide between uh, membrane-based receptors mediating consciousness and cytoskeleton or something else? And the answer is anesthesia. What mediates anesthesia? Is it mediated by synapses, which most people would say, uh, receptors, or does it come from the microtubules? 
1846, Claude Bernard showed that cytoplasmic streaming in amoeboid cells, slime mold amoeboid cells, was reversibly inhibited by chloroform. So here's the slime mold amoeba, and this is their cytoplasm, and it kind of flows and undulates in an appropriate direction, actually goal-oriented. Uh, and when he exposed it to chloroform, it stopped moving. And when he took away the chloroform, blew, uh, replaced it with air oxygen, they started moving again. In the 30s, uh, Seifritz and Christian showed that this anesthetic effect was directly on the cytoplasm, was not uh, mediated by membrane signaling. So it was happening directly uh, on the uh, cyto cytoplasm and cytoskeleton. And amoeba movement is similar to how axons and dendrites grow by microtubules polymerizing and then acting actin at the leading edge. So this process uh, was inhibited in, in the slime mold. Now, slime mold can actually, amoeba, amoeba slime mold, they can actually do clever things. And recently, uh, this, there have been a number of studies where um, amoeba solved the traveling salesman problem. In, in com uh, computer science, there's this thing called a traveling salesman problem. How do you get, let's say you got to go to eight cities, what's the most, uh, the most uh, efficient way to go? And what they did was they, they had an amoeba with, uh, in this, uh, with 64 uh, uh, little corners that they could flow into, and they, they would pick eight out of the 64 uh, and put food in them. And uh, the amoeba would, would solve the problem by getting, them, getting the food the fastest, by flowing into the proper uh, uh, channels. And so uh, this, was, this has been published a number of times that an amoeba using a cytoskeleton, it's microtubules and actin, can solve a traveling salesman problem. Okay, uh, we know that anesthesia selectively blocks consciousness, sparing non-conscious brain activities. Uh, what do they actually do in the brain? So um, anesthetic gases are chemically diverse. Uh, they include ethers, uh, halogenated hydrocarbons, nitrous oxide, and the inert element xenon. They don't look like each other. This is very unusual. Usually one class of drugs uh, is, is like the uh, other components of the class. But what the, the gases do have in common is that they have a, uh, outer shells that are filled with electrons. So xenon is, is a noble gas, so its outer electron is, uh, its outer shell has eight electrons. Anything with a, a halogen in it has a, 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 a completed outer shells uh, and uh, nitrous oxide as well. So what they have in common is a completed uh, outer shell without an electron to donate or a hole to receive. So they're basically inert chemically pretty much. Um, in fact, the, less, the, the more inert they are, the better they are in terms of, of uh, metabolism, uh, avoiding metabolism and therefore avoiding toxicity. We heard about sevoflurane possible toxicity a few weeks ago from, from Phil Malin. So they do share this uh, uh, filled outer shell, which gives them an inert surface. Scientists sought a common feature uh, related to anesthetic potency, one over MAC, and looked at solubility. So um, if, if you look at the human body or any animal body, and uh, imagine grinding it up and looking at different compartments where different drugs would dissolve, and this is kind of how pharmacologists think. Um, you get a bunch of different uh, solubility phases list, listed over here, numbered over here, and here's where they are. And this, this graph, basically, the, the key thing is polar, polarity goes in this direction. So here's water, it's, it's polar. And moving in this direction is more polar. As you go in this direction, you get nonpolar, uh, lipid-like, fat-like, uh, aromatic, aromatic rings, and aliphatics. And um, what they found was, the, and what uh, they, meaning Meyer and Overton, we've all heard of the Meyer-Overton correlation, Hans Meyer in 1897 and Charles Overton in 1901, um, they, they determined the potency of all these gases uh, in, in mice and salamanders and what have you. And MAC wasn't around then, but I, it's expressed here in MAC. And they plotted the potency uh, of the anesthetic. So the lower the MAC, the more potent versus their solubility in olive oil. And this is after searching a whole bunch of different solvents, they found olive oil. And what they found was the potency uh, correlated linearly, almost perfectly over many, many orders of magnitude. This is really astounding. Methoxyfluorine, uh, is, the MAC is about 0.25%. Uh, uh, so this is 1%, this is an atmosphere. So chloroform is about one, halothane I think is 0.76, methoxyfluorine 0.25. 
and you go up, you get less potent. And then nitrous oxide, you know, you need more than 100%. And even nitrogen at many, many uh, atmospheres is, is anesthetic, but uh, you have to be in a hyperbaric chamber. You have other problems with that. So uh, they found this amazing correlation over many orders of magnitude. Now, there are a couple of gases, non anesthetics are called, uh, for example, trifluoromethylbenzene and F6, which follow Meyer Overton and bind in lipid like pi resonance regions, but do not cause anesthesia, loss of consciousness. They are called non anesthetics or non immobilizers, if you don't believe in consciousness. And this is uh, also from uh, Eager's group. Uh, he did a lot of great work. Uh, I, I kind of gave him a hard time about a couple of things, but, but uh, this is really important. And uh, if we can figure out, if somebody can figure out how uh, these gases differ from anesthetics, because they, both, they all follow Meyer Overton, that would be a big clue to understanding consciousness. So going back to Meyer Overton and the solubility phase is where anesthetics act, uh, where Bing and where consciousness should arise is in these aromatic rings, uh, xylene, toluene, benzene, uh, down here, highly nonpolar, lipid-like. So uh, benzene uh, is the basis for organic chemistry. We all studied it. It has three extra electrons in a six carbon ring. The three extra electrons are uh, represented like this, and they form an electron cloud above and below the ring. And these electron clouds are nonpolar and inert, but they can induce they can have dipoles and then they can induce dipoles. So if you have two of these rings, they're attracted by van der Waals attraction and, for, and this one induces a dipole in this one, and this one induces a dipole in this one, and they oscillate back and forth. I should say that benzene in bulk form in your gas tank is explosive, but benzene, when it's in a, a, a geometric array and spatially separated, for example, in aromatic rings and proteins, uh, has a lot of very interesting quantum properties. Uh, for example, uh, graphene is, if you can see, these are all these hexagons, uh, it's just a big sheet of benzene put in, a, in one layer. And it has uh, interesting uh, uh, quantum and electronic properties. And when you put two of these sheets overlaid each other, so here, uh, and, and tilt them, angle them at just the right angle, 1.1 degrees, for example, two things happen. You get superconductivity, it gets to be a quantum system, and you get these moray patterns where you can see larger hexagons uh, made up of smaller hexagons. And this is kind of like a hologram, which Carl Prebrum suggested might be mediating consciousness. But it just shows that, the, that, that benzene and graphene is, has a lot of interesting quantum properties. And these rings coalesce in nonpolar regions inside proteins and lipid membranes. So in proteins, we have aromatic amino acids that are in the middle and are called hydrophobic pockets, for example. Uh, first in my cells and then proteins and lipid bilayers, they, they get together in the middle and, the, and uh, the aromatic rings, the benzene type rings are in the middle. And these are the nonpolar lipid like regions where anesthetics uh, bind. Uh, I should also say that the same pi resonance rings are found in uh, psychoactive and psychedelic molecules. Uh, dopamine and serotonin have them. Uh, serotonin has the indole ring with a six and a five. And the psychedelics all have them. LSD has a, a extended conjugated ring. DMT has the indole ring as does psilocybin, which caused those effects in, the, in uh, Carhart Harris's study. Um, so uh, there's something, they have something to do with uh, psychoactivity and, and mental states. In proteins, the uh, uh, aromatic rings, tryptophan, phenylalanine, uh, are found inside proteins. For example, tubulin that has 86 of them. And these little spheres, which you might be able to see, are where anesthetics bind. Uh, we uh, we kind of uh, simplified this to show uh, uh, a dipole, that these all could be aligned in a dipole in a, in a little model that we have here. I'll come back to that. So um, they can align and oscillate and, uh, and uh, form uh, dipoles that wrap around the microtubule. This is part of our theory that I'm not going to really talk about too much. Um, now, the anesthetic gases, uh, as I mentioned before, have regions of, that are, uh, have very, that are uh, nonpolar with the uh, completed outer shells. And this makes them uh, able to bind, uh, form their own van der Waals forces with uh, uh, aromatic rings and, and other uh, nonpolar groups. So basically 
uh, this is kind of the, the punchline, although I'm going to keep going for a while. But um, uh, if you have uh, aromatic rings, they could be part of amino acids inside a protein. Uh, they're going to indu- they're going to oscillate in terahertz. And what anesthetics do is they come in and they f- they they form their own uh, uh, van der Waals for- forces, but they're called dipole dispersion forces because uh, they don't match up quite quite the same, and they they block the oscillation. So I think what's happening is that anesthetics prevent dipole oscillations among these aromatic rings somewhere in the brain. Uh, so, uh, so this is anesthetized unconscious on the right. This would be conscious or potentially conscious on the left. So for most of the uh, 20th century, going into the 20th century, uh, uh, scientists knew that uh, anesthetic through Meyer Overton uh, bound in nonpolar uh, lipid-like regions. And the first attempt uh, at explaining anesthetics was that they they get into the lipid uh, uh, region of the uh, membrane and uh, just by bulk volume expansion cause uh, <clears throat> kind of uh, prevent activity uh, just due to volume expansion. The critical volume hypothesis was the first theory. Uh, and then in the 60s and 70s, it became realized that proteins, uh, receptors and ion channels in membranes were essential for uh, uh, neuronal membrane signaling and, and, Meyer, uh, and um, Hodgkin-Huxley behavior. And uh, Jim Trudell, whom I knew, uh, and Bruce McIver, I was a good collaborator of him, uh, uh, kind of uh, wanted to uh, keep the uh, lipid side of a- action. So he had a, he used a, a sodium channel, which would open. And he said the anesthetics get in and caused a, a phase transition in the lipid and that extrinsically prevented the, uh, the, the ion channel from opening. So he was, uh, he, he was incorporating ion channels, but still re- relying on uh, uh, lipid side of action. But the problem was that that uh, two degree temperature shift had the same effect as the phase transition that that he uh, was purporting was was causing the uh, anesthesia, and you don't lose consciousness with a slight fever. So uh, this this turned out to be not correct. And then uh, in the eighties, uh, Nick Franks and and Bill uh, Lieb showed anesthetics act directly in proteins in nonpolar hydrophobic pockets, for example, in the membrane free luciferase. So inside luciferase, and they could de- uh, measure its activity by light emission. And these, are, this is essentially firefly uh, protein. And they, uh, they found the uh, inhibition of the light emission for firefly protein proportional to MAC. So they showed that you don't need lipids, you don't need uh, membranes. You can act directly on proteins. So which proteins? Well, the obvious choice to most people was uh, ligand, ligand gated ion channels and indeed, anesthetic gases do bind to membrane receptors uh, for serotonin, glycine, acetylcholine, and GABA-A, GABA-A being an inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter. Um, but experiments produce conflicting results. Some anesthetics open a channel, others close it. Not all anesthetics bind to any one receptor. Uh, in an editorial in anesthesiology, uh, Alex Evers and, and Jim Steinbach uh, called anesthetics double-edged swords, saying that volatile anesthetics both enhance and inhibit ligand-gated ion channels. Well, if they enhance the inhibitory and inhibited the excitatory, that would, that would work, but that's not how it was. The uh, volatile anesthetics both enhance and inhibit excitatory uh, acetylcholine receptors, and they enhance uh, the inhibitory at low dose, but inhibit at high dose. So this is the opposite of what you might expect. A number of other papers show that anesthetics do not act on membrane protein re- receptors, despite what everybody says. Uh, and at the top, uh, acetylcholine, no longer in the picture. Uh, acetylcholine 5-HC opioid adrenergic and potassium receptors do not mediate immobility, which is the code word for anesthesia if you don't believe in consciousness. Um, GABA receptors do not mediate the mobility. GABA receptors may not be involved. Genetic inactivation GABA receptors had no effect on immobility. Despite this, if I, I'm pretty sure the textbooks still say GABA receptors. <laughs> and Ted Eager, another really good thing that he did in a paper in 2008, realized that this wasn't working and kind of waved the, waved the white flag and said that is a new paradigm needed to explain inhaled anesthetics, how in, inhaled anesthetics produce immobility. You can read it. Two decades of focused investigations have not identified a, a, a channel that alone is sufficient to mediate immobility. He named all the channels. Furthermore, no combination 
of any of them seemed sufficient. And he called for a new paradigm. When I read this, I said, yeah, microtubules. And I wrote to him, I wrote to the editors uh, and suggested this, but Eager suggested going back to lipid, lipid theories, which have gone nowhere in the last uh, 13 years. So a uh, new paradigm is needed, but not the one he selected. So anyway, uh, the, the field was at a crossroads. Uh, go to, go to membrane proteins, despite these negative findings, or go back to Claude Bernard and the cytoskeleton. So we mentioned Claude Bernard. And um, in 1968, uh, Allison and Nunn, John Nunn, shown here, uh, who was from the UK and whom I met several times. Uh, he was a friend of Brunel and, and Brunel's and came to visit uh, and give talks several times. Did a study on actinospherium, this little, sea, this little urchin, which had these axonemes sticking out. The axonemes were made of microtubules in this double, uh, double spiral. So this is a cross section of one of, these, one of these guys. And when they exposed them to halothane, all the axonemes depolymerized. They just vanished. They, they just disassembled. However, this was at uh, five mac, but it, it showed that uh, anesthesia does bind to tubulin and microtubules. Uh, but depolymer depolymerization was not the uh, it was not the cause of anesthesia. However, it makes you worry uh, because uh, depolymerization of microtubules is basically Alzheimer's disease or can cause something similar to Alzheimer's disease. And too much anesthesia uh, over a prolonged period of time or repetitively uh, might be a problem. Um, Brunel knew I was interested in microtubules and consciousness and handed me this paper and said, uh, if you want to figure out anesthesia, uh, figure out consciousness, uh, figure out how anesthesia works, and you knew I was interested in microtubules. So this helped me, helped convince me to go into anesthesia, even though it was at 5 MAC, which, um, so depolymerization per se does not cause loss of consciousness. Uh, now, more recently, well, in 2008, uh, Eckenhoff's lab, Rod, uh, Rod Eckenhoff, shown up or left there, and his uh, group at Penn uh, did a systematic approach. They and they uh, they looked at they found 70 proteins. They they did radio labeled halothane binding and mouse mouse brain, and they found 70 proteins in the brain neurons. Neurons from the spell there, sorry, found to bind anesthetics half in the membrane and half in cytoplasm. They they uh, they then did uh, genomic, uh, they looked at uh, altered genetic expression of, uh, of certain proteins and they found, uh, they found three proteins common that were, uh, whose genetic expression was altered by both, by both anesthetics, tubulin and two other proteins, which don't seem rele relevant to any uh, signaling. And so among the candidates, they concluded that uh, proteomics and genomics point to microtubules as the site of action of anesthetics. They also showed, by the way, clinically that, that people on Taxol, like for breast cancer, which, uh, which stabilizes microtubules, require more anesthesia. It, their MAC is, is higher, possibly because uh, the, the, the uh, microtubules are, are harder to get to. They also, they then did a study uh, uh, with, uh, with tadpoles and tadpoles have conveniently transparent heads and they used a fluorescent uh, anthracene anesthetic uh, which they, they gave uh, to the tadpoles, which was only active as an anesthetic when they illuminated it with ultraviolet light. So they gave them this anesthetic, the, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're swimming around, they turn on the light and they just stop and, and roll over and, and they're anesthetized. And they then uh, donated their, their tadpole brains to science and they found that the anthracene was bound to microtubules. So uh, they, they uh, concluded that uh, direct modulation of microtubules contributes to general anesthesia. They wouldn't say that it's the end all be all, but they, they gave us a shout uh, consistent with our theory, although that's not quite our theory, but close enough uh, that microtubules are responsible for consciousness. Now we then, we meaning my colleagues, uh, Travis Craddock, uh, Jack Jusinski and others, uh, in this paper in Nature Scientific Reports in 2017, did a computer modeling study. And this, this guy, Philip Curian, uh, had access to this gigantic computer somewhere back east. And we, uh, I, I showed you the, the oscillations of two, two benzenes. So what we did here, what they did was take all 86 pi resonance rings and model the oscillations and interactions between all 86 of them at room temperature. Uh, and using these three aromatic amino acids, uh, tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine. And uh, 
what we found was a, at, at ambient temperature at, at KT, a spectrum of collective dipole oscillations with a common mode peak at about 613 terahertz in the blue light region of the spectrum. The presence of each of the, uh, the presence of each of eight anesthetic gases uh, and non-anesthetic. So there's methoxyfluorine, halothane, uh, isofluorine, enfluorine, sevofluorine, diethyl ether, and dusfluorine. Um, and nitrous oxide. The presence of each of the anesthetics abolish the 613 peak and dampen other terahertz frequencies proportional to anesthetic potency. So here's some sub subtraction spectra. So uh, here's the 613, uh, 613 terahertz peak with desferrain and negative means it's gone. So it's missing from the spectrum uh, that had them. The same with diethyl ether, 613 is gone. Enfluorine, halothane, uh, isofluorine, methoxyfluorine, nitrous oxide, SIVO. Now, F6 is one of those non-anesthetics, okay? It, it follows Meyer-Overton, but it doesn't cause anesthesia, and it did not affect the 613 peak. It, it affected another peak that was lower. Uh, TFMP, trifluoromethylbenzene, actually increased the 613 terahertz peak. And fluethol, which is uh, uh, a convulsant, uh, an anesthetic and a convulsant uh, acted as an anesthetic and diminished the 613 peak. So all the anesthetics uh, abolished the 613 terahertz peak. Uh, the non-anesthetics did not. Now uh, the 613, just uh, uh, by the way, is in the, the blue or blue-green uh, spectrum. And in Hindu uh, 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 philosophy, the Hindu deities are often portrayed as blue when they're being spiritual. So that may be a coincidence, I don't know. But um, let's go back to the non-anesthetic gases, uh, the TFMP and the F6, which follow Meyer-Overton, but do not cause anesthesia. And here we see them over on the right, where their MAC would be a thousand or could be infinite because they don't cause anesthesia and where their solubility would be. And uh, so they're in the range of where anesthetic should act solubility-wise. They're between halothane and methoxyfluorine, or down by, by sevofluorine. Why don't they cause anesthesia? So this is the oil gas partition coefficient, this is MAC. So as I said before, uh, they, don't cut, they don't abolish 613 peak, they abolish a lower one or they increase it. Uh, why is that? Um, they had no effect on tubulin terahertz, why not? Well, we, we plotted all the anesthetics and non-anesthetics against another uh, uh, property, polarizability. And what's interesting before I get to the non-anesthetics is that all the anesthetics, uh, this is methoxyfluorine, this is diethyl ether, uh, they all, uh, they get, you get a pretty good Meyer-Overton-like correlation just for polarizability. So this might have something to do, and this has to do with how, how the dipoles can oscillate. Um, and the, the non-anesthetics are out of range. They're either way high or, or just above, or they're actually too potent. So they, 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 they're, they would be more potent than methoxyfluorine. Um, so what we think this meant was that normally the dipoles are oscillating like this. Uh, an anesthetic is gonna gum up the works and prevent dipole dispersion, but the non-anesthetics uh, go along for the ride. They're highly polarizable. So when these guys uh, uh, polarize this way, they go along for it and they oscillate back and forth. They, so they, they apparently just go along for the ride uh, due to their high polarizability. And even though they're binding where the anesthetics bind, uh, they, they don't cause anesthesia. I think this is the only uh, explanation for uh, non-anesthetics uh, not causing uh, uh, loss of consciousness. And this is part of, a, uh, of our uh, overall theory, I'm gonna wrap up now, uh, of a multi-scale hier hierarchy where you start with neurons, instead of going upward, well, in addition to going upward, you go downward in scale, and uh, we know that these oscillations occur at these levels in microtubules and the tubulins. And down here with the pi, cl pi cl resonance cloud dipole oscillations is where anesthetics act to gum up the works. So therefore that blocks everything going up higher. And down here it connects to uh, the physics of the universe, but that's another story uh, that with Roger Penrose's work and so forth. And here's some evidence for these uh, coherent uh, resonances from Anurban Bandipati's group at levels of neurons, individual microtubules, and, and tubulins, 
where you see uh, terahertz, gigahertz, megahertz, uh, kilohertz oscillations over many orders of mag, uh, repeating every three orders of magnitude in this triplet of triplet uh, um, arrangement. So these are repeating cell similar fractal like patterns that repeat uh, all the way up from um, at least from uh, from here all the way up to uh, to neurons. Conclusion: Despite conventional wisdom, objective evidence points to the origin of consciousness in the site of action of anesthetic gases as quantum vibrations in microtubules inside brain neurons. And by the way, if you if you go to Wikipedia and look up uh, uh, theories of anesthesia, or theoretical mechanisms of anesthesia. Go all the way to the bottom. There's a very nice uh, section on the quantum vibration theory of, of microtubules uh, mediating anesthesia. Um, and finally, this hypothesis is currently being tested in the TWF uh, Templeton World Charity Foundation program and experiments at Princeton and South Florida. And let me just say uh, uh, one thing about that. Um, uh, photosynthesis proteins were the first proteins to show uh, quantum, quantum states at warm temperature. Everybody said it's, uh, you have to be really cold temperature. And it, uh, what you do to show it in a protein is shine a laser, uh, several lasers actually, and you measure signals. And if you get the sawtooth peak, that's an indicative of interference pattern. So this was shown for photosynthesis protein, which is what proved uh, that they have quantum coherence. And we are uh, in the process of doing that ex exact same experiment or similar experiments in tubulin at Greg Skoll's lab at Princeton. Um, uh, even as we speak. And Greg Scholes is a, is a leader in quantum biology, and he's not an aficionado of microtubules or anything else, but uh, we've already found significant quantum uh, states and microtubules that last five nanoseconds, which we think is the world record. So we're currently being tested. Uh, we've shown the quantum states. We then uh, intend to study effects of anesthesia on them. And if we get a uh, MAC-like meyer overton correlation with uh, anesthetics uh, dampening uh, and the interference patterns and other quantum states and microtubules, I think we'll justifiably be able to claim that anesthesia acts by dampening these vibrations and uh, quantum vibrations and microtubules, which are also the origin of consciousness. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be glad to take some questions. Well, that was all really fascinating. And I think I'm going to need some time to keep <laughs> thinking about it and let it soak in before I <laughs> have a near enough um, understanding as I should. But um, one question I did have was a lot of the work that you mentioned on um, the tubulin terahertz was on inhaled anesthetics. Um, so how do you address IV anesthetics? Um, in right. Terms of Great question. We're going to do propofol. And uh, I, I should say off the, the bat that propofol ketamine and detomidate all do bind to microtubules, to tubulin. And uh, uh, they, they, get in, and they get inside the cell. I mean, uh, supposedly the uh, ketamine acts at uh, uh, NMDA receptors and propofol acts at GABA receptors, which they undoubtedly do, but so do uh, the volatiles. They all act at the uh, membrane proteins. Um, but that doesn't mean they act there. You know, uh, uh, anesthetic gases uh, go to la uh, fat stores, lipid stores, so I sometimes tell a residents there's more anesthetic gas in the patient's butt than in their brain, but you know the anesthetics working in the brain, not in the butt. So there may be anesthetic gases in the uh, in the membrane uh, receptors, and there may be propofol in the GABA receptor. There there is, we know that. Um, but that's not to say that's where that's where they act. They're going to go to any uh, non any nonpolar region. And uh, we've done some studies on uh, propofol binding to uh, to tubulin. And uh, we will uh, test propofol. Bruce McIver, who's doing the anesthesia experiments, who is not a, a, a microtubule uh, person, he's, he's a GABA person, he's GABA A receptor, he believes that it's GABA A receptors. And he was going to, uh, I invited him to this talk, but he's in Hawaii, so he's going to watch the, uh, the uh, replay. And uh, so he, he asked me, I said, yeah, let's, let's test for propofol. And propofol, if you look at the molecule, it's basically a benzene ring with a couple of doodads on it. It's, it's very much like the other, uh, the other and, and, and and ketamine also. They all have these pi resonance rings. And therefore, they're likely to get inside the neuron um, uh, in addition to binding the receptors. So that's a very good question, and uh, we're going to test that. But it's unclear whether they follow Meyer-Overton or not. But nonetheless, if they cause loss of consciousness, they sh and our theory is right, they should directly or indirectly uh, uh, dampen the quantum vibrations in microtubules. So we will definitely look at that. Very cool. Thank you. 
Stu, can you talk about memory and uh, how this plays out with memory a little bit in maybe a minute or so? <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, most people say hey. that uh, mem memory is in synaptic plasticity, you know, the long-term potentiation. If you stimulate a, a, a neuron high intensity briefly, you get a prolonged uh, sensitivity in the postsynaptic neuron. So the receptors, uh, synapse adapts and becomes more sensitive to whatever caused the initial one. So you can elicit memories. That's, that's a theory. The problem is that those membrane proteins are uh, in the synapses are, are transient. They, they're recycled hours to days. They're only there a short time. And yet memories can last lifetimes. So um, we, we think that memory is in microtubules. I know it sounds like, uh, I sound like a broken record, but there's more, there's actually uh, some good indication for that. If your microtubules fall apart, you get Alzheimer's. That's number one. Uh, I didn't show this, but we did a study uh, a few years ago with um, a modeling study with calcium calmodulin kinase 2, CAMK2. And in long-term potentiation, calcium comes in and activates CAMK2 in this, this hexagonal kinase domain. And uh, I remember uh, looking at this hexagonal kinase domain, and uh, I remember Brenda, Brenda Kent was talking to me in the background, and I was kind of uh, zooming in and, and uh, on this and, and unfortunately ignoring her, which she reminded me of much later. But um, uh, the he hexagon of the CAMK2 precisely matches the hexagon of the tubular lattice, microtubular lattice. And so we did computer modeling and we showed that, that the CAMK2 can bind to microtubular lattices and phosphorylate up to six tubulins at a time, uh, six bits of information at a time. And thousands of these things come in with each synaptic event. So I would, I would argue and I would bet money that memory is in microtubules. Uh, there's uh, each tubulin in a microtubule lattice can be uh, 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 <clears throat> post-translationally modified, uh, phosphorylated, uh, many things can be done to, to program it, to encode it. So it's really the perfect system to encode memory. And the microtubules in dendrites and soma are stable. In, in non-neuronal cells, they have to depolymerize and then repolymerize for mitosis for cell division. Uh, in, in neurons, they don't divide, so they don't have to do that. And in dendrites, they're capped at both ends. So they're, they stay the same. So you can encode a long-term memory in, uh, uh, in microtubules and perhaps neurofilaments, which are even more stable. So in a nutshell, memory in microtubules. Hey, Dr. Hameroff, I was just wondering, do you think that you have to be able to form memories in order to be conscious? Like, is that a part of the definition of consciousness? For example, when a patient wakes up from anesthesia, and they had a conversation with you and they asked the same question in 30 seconds, uh, could it be said that they're in that zombie mode type of thing or do you need to have that to meet the definition of a conscious being or however you would classify it? Right, that's an excellent question. And uh, let me first say that uh, uh, some people claim that, uh, that our patients never lose consciousness, they just don't remember. And you know we're we're torturing them. They're being operated on, and uh, they just they just don't remember. We call those. Uh, and it's, it's hard to refute that because we can't prove they're conscious. I can't prove that anybody's conscious. You can't prove that I'm, I'm conscious. All we know, all I know, is that I'm conscious, and I assume you are. Um, I don't. But in answer to your specific specific question, I don't. You don't need memory to be conscious. And there are people who are amnestic. Uh, H.H., a famous guy who, I forget what part of his brain he lost, but he had no, no he had total amnesia. He was conscious. So I don't think you need memory uh, to be conscious. Uh, but I don't think that anesthesia is loss, is loss of memory with consciousness. Because, you know, if a patient gets light, they're autonomic, they're going to see autonomic responses, et cetera, et cetera. But it's impossible to refute that because we can't uh, prove consciousness per se. So piggybacking off of that, how could you possibly prove consciousness or is that a talk for another time? How could you what? Oh, sorry. How is there a way to prove that someone's consciousness? Like, do you think like within the next 50 years, we'll be able to prove that someone's conscious and someone's not like pending their political party or something like that? I don't know. <laughs> Please don't bring politics into this. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, in the Templeton project, one of my ad, uh, adversaries said, well, wanted us to do what we're attempting to do at, at the Princeton lab on individual tubulins in a brain in a moving monkey. And I said, you know, not, not yet, maybe in 50 years we'll be able to do that. It's possible to, uh, so the, the point is that if we could, if we could show 
these quantum interference, assume we can show it in tubulin and microtubules. If we, sh if we could show it in a, uh, uh, in a, in a, in a, a brain of a living uh, entity, then maybe. But according to our theory, you also need to reach collapse. Uh, you need to reach this quantum state reduction, which makes it a little bit trickier. So eventually maybe, but, but uh, I think uh, we got a lot of work to do first before we can even answer that question, find out exactly where it's coming from and, uh, and you know, how anesthesia works. So uh, uh, it's all, but it's also, you know, people talk about downloading or uploading their consciousness, you know, uh, billionaires want to be able to put their consciousness in a computer when their body dies and so forth. So there's all this effort. So AI, uh, it's kind of a big scam, you know, uh, people either preserving their brains and, and cr uh, cryopreserving their brains, freezing them, which destroys all the microtubules, by the way, um, or downloading into some kind of computer, you know, uh, but classical computers, I don't think will ever be conscious. The only possible way might be to, to use some uh, pseudo -bio biological system like graphene, like I said, or, or fullerenes, which are nanotubes, which have these pi resonance, uh, something like that it might be possible to have, uh, to down, be able to download your consciousness into something like that. Um, maybe, I don't know. That would be the only way. I don't think uh, putting in a classical computer or, or preserving uh, brains could do it. Thank you, sir. That was a great talk. Thank you. Hey, Stuart, it's Phil. Can you hear me? Hey, Phil, how you doing? Um, do microtubules communicate across cells? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yes. And there's, I, I didn't show, uh, my friend Anurban Bandipade, uh, who's at, I mentioned his other work, has a, a paper coming out in Journal of Neurophysiology. This is really interesting. Um, he, uh, he basically shows, well, he, 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 he uses something called a dielectric uh, dielectric resonance probe that's kind of like an ATM tip that goes inside the cell and can measure uh, three different frequency ranges uh, or two different gigahertz and megahertz. And he finds uh, gigahertz and megahertz uh, oscillations in a living cell with this probe. And then he correlates the frequencies in one area of the cell and another area of the cell or in one cell and another cell. And uh, he has found correlations. Uh, it's just kind of, um, and, and he finds that they're coming from, and then when he gives drugs that uh, wipes out all the microtubules and all the actin, and there's no, um, there's no cytoskeleton, uh, there's no correlation. Um, but um, the, interestingly, the axon still fires, the membranes still fire, and, but we know axons fire without consciousness. We know membranes fire without consciousness. So that's consistent with what I'm saying. Um, but, um, as far as your question, there, there's, you know, the effaptic, effaptic transmission in the brain, which is basically electromagnetic field pervade the brain. And that's one way that there can be uh, interaction among your neurons that don't require uh, synapses. Uh, and how that electromagnetic uh, field is mediated is another, is another question. Honorbound's work would suggest they come from the cytoskeleton, which are, which are uh, you know, able to do stuff like that. So, um, Interestingly, in, in Anurban's paper, he showed that the microtubules and the actin were, were, were causing this, this correlation and also uh, uh, affecting those in the dendrites. So the, the axon goes in, it branches, and it turns out that, that this branch can fire and this one doesn't. So there can be selective firing in the distal arborizations of the axon. I didn't know this. And uh, apparently, activity in the soma and the dendrite can, can determine whether it's this axon branch that fires or this axon branch that fires. And, uh, and, and there's this non-local correlation. And even activity in another neuron can do that. So, uh, uh, I've, um, but it showed that the microtubules are responsible, but Anurban said the editors of Journal of Neurophysiology, he followed them for three years to get this in print because it's so, uh, you know, contrary to uh, uh, conventional thinking. They finally agreed, <laughs> but they said, okay, but you can't mention Hameroff or Penrose and you can't mention microtubules. So uh, he didn't, although he said, he said filaments, he called them filaments. And then somewhere in a little footnote is filaments are microtubules and, and actin and filaments. So uh, I guess I've pissed off a lot of people in the, in the scientific world, but um, uh, they, they think we're crazy, but data's on our side, I'm sorry. We'll, we'll, and we'll see. So this paper will be coming out journal Neur neurophysiology, even if it doesn't mention us, 
that supports exactly what we're saying. And uh, he has another one, another one come out in a different journal along similar lines. So the, the answer to your question is yes. Great talk, Dr. Hameroff. Um, other than avoiding anesthesia and being otherwise healthy, what can we do to safeguard our Safeguard, like uh, you mean like for Alzheimer's for, um, is that what you're referring to? I, I can't see who's talking, but um, uh, you know, uh, I worry about elderly patients. Also uh, peds, uh, Allison probably knows way more about this, uh, but, but kids who get multiple anesthetics and it doesn't matter whether it's gas, propofol, ketamine, they can get, uh, uh, of course, there's so many other factors just being in the hospital and so forth, but they're seeing, and so this is a controversial subject and anesthesiologists sometimes like to uh, kind of hide this, uh, that there could be some uh, deleterious effect of repetitive anesthetics in babies or in, in elderly. Um, but I, I, I think, and I wrote an article about this uh, recently and, uh, um, you know, you want to avoid prolonged, you want to avoid repetitive, and you want to avoid uh, cold temperature, I would say, if, if you're, uh, because cold uh, destabilizes the, the cytoskeleton. So if you have to uh, repetitively anesthetize uh, 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 anybody, but particularly uh, uh, babies and, and elderly, keep them warm and, uh, and try to you know, minimize the MAC. I don't know whether mixing propofol and gas, you know, keeping low levels of, of both would help. I don't know. The, the data on this is very murky, um, but I think there's a real effect on, uh, and it, it's probably mediated through the, through the cytoskeleton, so the microtubules. Since as we saw, five MAC at least depolymerizes microtubules, at least in a sea urchin, and uh, may do something similar in, in our brains. Yeah, and there's some evidence that um, drugs like dexmedetomidine and xenon have some protective effect um, to the more standard like sebaflurin induced neurotoxicity that we've seen in animal models and things like that. Um, although, yeah, exactly. We, we don't know a lot of information about the, in clinical studies and with prolonged or multiple anesthetics yet in children. Those are- yeah, Thank you, Elsa. Um, and Mervyn, Mervyn Mays was, you know, has been pushing that for a while. Is there any evidence to, uh, that xenon is protective? Yeah, in, in um, some of their, their animal studies, there's been none in, in humans yet, I believe, at least has been published. Maybe they're working on it right now, but, uh, um, but yeah, um, both dexmedetomidine and xenon, there was a paper um, I found a couple years back. I can send you if I can find it again. Um, yeah, thank you. About that. Since we were talking about uh, the kids and um, um, uh, anesthetic toxicity, what about uh, inflammation in the brain um, destabilizing the microtubules? Isn't that a, I mean, wouldn't that be more of a concern than even the, the anesthetics? Uh? Yeah, inflammation uh, is, it seems to be correlated with, uh, with uh, dementia and Alzheimer's and so forth. But, you know, I, I often wonder, dementia can cause, can, uh, sorry, inflammation can destabilize microtubules, but uh, destabilized microtubules might also cause inflammation. Um, for example, tau, uh, we know about tau is a marker of Alzheimer's and, and, and brain damage. And tau is actually a microtubule associated protein. Its normal function is it's stuck on a microtubule in a specific location on the microtubule lattice. And in fact, there's evidence that the, the precise location is a signal for, for trafficking. You know, uh, um, Materials that are required for a synapse, uh, for upregulated or downregulated synapse, are synthesized in the cell body and then transported along the microtubules by these motor proteins that quite literally walk along or actually run along the microtubule carrying uh, an enzyme. And uh, uh, paper, uh, I didn't show the slide, but um, uh, somebody showed that that um, the tau the the tau protein tells the mo motor protein where to get off. So. When you think about it, these motor proteins running along these uh, uh, microtubules, particularly in dendrites, where the microtubules are interrupted, they have to go along and they have to jump from one microtubule to another. Then they come to a branch point, you know, in dendrites. Do they go this way or do they go that way? And then they come to the right synapse and they have to say, okay, get off here and deliver your cargo to this particular synapse, which needs uh, upregulation for this enzyme. And, how, you know, how do they know where to go? Well, it turns out the tau protein is a traffic signal that tells them where to get off and where to deliver their cargo at a particular synapse. So that's synaptic plasticity. Synaptic plasticity 
depends on, on the uh, microtubules and the tau proteins as uh, encoding. It's a really a form of memory because it's, it's telling which synapse uh, to fortify. Um, so um, um, uh, the, the tau is also a marker of, of inflammation and of, of uh, demise of, uh, of dementia and Alzheimer's. And uh, it's unclear whether the, uh, the tau falls off the microtubule and that destabilizes the microtubule or the tau uh, gets hyperphosphorylated first and then falls off. Uh, it, it's unclear which comes first, but in both cases, you lose, you lose the microtubules and, and then you lose synapses and you lose the advantage of the tau on the microtubule. Um, and when that happens, you know, stuff gets released and you can cause inflammation. Uh, so the pro, you know, we don't know which, which is the chicken and which is the egg, but I would say we have to consider at least that, um, that the, uh, the microtubules falling apart, release of tau, uh, breakdown of the membrane will release uh, some kind of nasties into the general circulation, which result in inflammation. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hammeroff. Does anyone have any other questions for him? Very enlightening talk. Thank you so much. And thanks. I'm just, yeah, thanks so much. Um, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to remind everyone about the bedside pass um, thing that I had presented last week that's going to go live um, June 1st. Um, I'm going to share my screen just again to remind you guys what that is. So... This is the bedside procedure pass. As I mentioned last week, this is going to roll out June 1st um, for any procedures that we do outside of the operating room. This includes arterial lines, um, blocks, neuraxial catheters, um, anything like that. Um, and the nursing staff will also be um, trained on this as well and aware. And so essentially every time that we need to do a procedure that is outside of the operating room, this um, procedure needs to, um, this pass needs to happen. So you need to have a briefing sometime beforehand with the, with the team members involved. Doesn't necessarily need to be in person. You can do it over the phone. The timeout, of course, as usual, should be done immediately before you either touch the patient or start giving anesthetic for the procedure. Um, and then a debriefing afterwards as well. Um, we had discussed how, um, you know, in this, our banner leadership had, um, you know, said that residents um, or, you know, non-attending um, providers could um, be performing this part um, without supervision as long as they were considered to be sort of signed off by their program. And so um, Paul and I sort of discussed how we were going to um, define that for everyone. And I think what we felt like would be easiest and most straightforward instead of giving everyone numbers for each procedure is that, you um, the resident should just communicate with their attending who is going to be officially supervising that procedure with them, um, either the night before, if it's a planned thing, or right before, if it's more of an unplanned procedure. Um, and that communication should happen and should be decided by both parties on um, how, how much supervision is needed by the attending um, for each part of this. Okay, so that will just kind of make it simple um, for everything. So just communicate with their attending you guys come up with a plan that everyone feels comfortable with. Um, and then um, whether that's just the resident and the nurse or the resident and the attending and the nurse, um, make sure to please do this procedure and we'll make sure to have copies of this in the block carts, NOB, um, PACU pre-op, all of those areas um, by June 1st so that um, you can have this on hand. And also, um, I believe we'll try to get like a PDF copy or something from it as well. So maybe we can put it on the propofol site um, and that way you can ex you guys can access it there as well. Um, are there any questions about that or Paul, did you want to add anything? I'll just say that, you know, it's, it's uh, just a part of the, you know, communication, you know, if you're going to do an A-line and pre-op, you know, you know, talk about it with, you know, that that's a part of your plan that you discuss with the attending the night before, and then you just do a timeout with the, you know, with the nurse and pre-op right before uh, you do your, your arterial line. Um, you know, if you're up in the ICU uh, and you're going to do a central line where, where this would be a part of, you know, you, you'd need to do a timeout, you know, you're not going to do a central line on a patient without, you know, discussing it with the attending and, and talking about, you know, uh, doing the central line or, or the arterial line or whatever. So um, this isn't like, 
a, a big new thing for our department. Uh, we're going to, you're not, you're not going to do a block without, you know, calling the block faculty and say, Hey, we're in Bay 23. We're ready to do a block. You know, this isn't a big, um, a big change for our department. This is, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to talk about communicate before we do a procedure. And, um, you know, there's going to be a few, um, things that the nurses are going to start at adding, uh, to help make, uh, things more safe for other departments. But, um, you know, our attendings are going to be, you know, um, for the anesthesia department are going to be there and be aware of, um, what's happening with the patients. So it's not, um, you know, this isn't a big shock and surprise and, you know, so was that clear? Uh, what I said, <laughs> just call your attending, uh, before you do a procedure. <laughs> yeah, call your training and make sure the nurse is there to go through this with you. Anybody questions um, regarding how how we're going to handle this? Cool. I'm going to sign off. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks again, Dr. Hammerhoff. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, too. <laughs> thanks, everybody.